the king, Jesus was moved from a place of luxury and put into the middle of dysfunction. The king was taken, a, was taken away from his kingdom, just as Jesus was, and placed in the middle of a mess. Just look at the disciples of Jesus. One of the reasons Jesus was brought here was to bring order. But there was something that Jesus brought with him as well. And that was this thing that we call hope. And I'm going to give you guys some example. This is why we're going to go into word today. And I didn't give them the verses, so it's okay. It's not their fault. But I'm going to read it from my phone. Because Jesus, before he was crucified, he said these words. It's coming. Wait for it. It's very exciting. John chapter 17, verse 1. He said, And lifting my eyes to heaven, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. But that wasn't enough for him. Even through death, he kept this, this thing called hope with him. And we see that because in Job chapter 11, same John, 41, it says they removed the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. See, this hope that we talk about is something that Jesus carried with him even through death. And it has friends. And those friends are the friends that I'm going to try to introduce you today. And I'm going to get to that later. But first, I'm going to try to read you guys something that you guys should know. We're going to get into word today. So I hope you guys brought your Bibles. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 2. It says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And the key word here that I want you guys to focus on is above. Why does he say above? Because the Christian answer that you guys are probably going to tell me is because God is above and heaven is above. And when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. So above. But let me, you guys, let me give you guys an analogy. I know there are people here who tell me that they like to stare at the ocean. Anybody like to stare at the ocean, right? I think it's very boring, but some people tell me that they like to stare at the ocean. But it's, I understand it because it's scientifically proven that when a person looks at something that is bigger than themselves, that cannot be moved, it brings a sense of relief over them. Because we live in a world, metaphorically, where we have what I call the forces of gravity. What's an example? Fear. Fear paints an image for you, an image that does not yet exist, the same thing that faith does. But the one that fear creates is one that was never meant to pass. It's a force of gravity meant to pull you down. That's why it says above, because the higher you go, when you get past this earth, gravity can no longer work. It's gone. And Jesus, being human, one of the things that he did, because if you ask yourself, how can someone like Jesus love in a world when everybody just hated? How could you hope for salvation when everybody had already judged him condemned? But it's back to this world called hope. Because your eyes place tricks on you. So Jesus will literally look up, literally look up to heaven. So his mind wouldn't start to play tricks on you. Because when that happens, that's when you start to get confused. That's when you lose your purpose. That's when you no longer know where you're going and where you're meant to be. But there's something else. There's another word that follows hope. And if someone can't answer it, I'll, I'm not going to give you $5. But I'll give you $5 of, no, never mind. What is this word that follows hope? Does anyone know? It, literally, throughout the Bible, you Bible readers, if you claim to be, everywhere throughout the Bible, Natasha, no, pastor's daughter, no. But literally throughout the Bible, there's this one word, wherever it goes, hope follows. No, it's not faith, but nice try. Okay, how about this? Everyone take out your phones. Look up Google, if you have Google. Look up the word hope, definition of hope. It's right there, guys. Expectation, pretty oh, girl, I love you. Anyways, this word called expectation is something that follows hope around everywhere it goes. And the reason that it does that is because these two things create a foundation for your faith. And that's probably the most important sentence that I'll give you today. The foundation of your faith. Everybody here has told you before that you can't have hope without your faith. You cannot have faith without your love. Because the definition of faith in itself is the evidence of things hoped for. 
So if your hope is not where it needs to be, an engineer will know when your foundation is not made of the right material, you will falter and it will fail. But there is an order to faith. And step number one is hope. Step number two, given by the Spirit, is expectation. If you don't believe me, Luke chapter 8. I'm not going to read it, but you guys know the story of the woman with the issue of blood, right? She saw a man walking, someone that she put her hope in. And because of that, she followed him to the point where she began to expect that she could be healed. And once she was healed, Jesus then says to her, woman, by your faith, you have been healed. There is an order to things, an order that follows. But if your hope is on something that can be taken away from you, then I promise you it will. It will be taken away, just like King Nebuchadnezzar. What was his hope in? Where did he place his hope in? His kingdom, his own ability to conquer. But the Bible said that even his sanity was taken away from him. Right? But now let's go into what I really came to give you guys. The different types of hope. These are the seven signs of hope. And if you guys want to write this down, Because hope is not something that we just listen to in a Disney song. It's something that brings something with it. It's supernatural. And I'm going to give you sign number one. It's called redemption. The first step, the first sign of hope. Redemption. Psalms 130, verse 7. I'm going to read it to you. It says, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfeeling love, and with him is full redemption. That's sign number one, where you are brought to repentance, to redemption. That's something that comes by hope, hope given by the Spirit. But once you have redemption, hope does something else to you. It promises you a future. It guarantees you a destiny. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You guys should know that one. But not only does it guarantee you a future, it guides you to that future. It leads you along a path. It gives you a way of truth to follow. Psalms 25, verse 5. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior and my hope is in you all day. But when it leads you, even then it does not leave you alone. For it comes to give you strength. It comes to give you courage. Psalms 31, 24. It says, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. And this is one of my favorites. Well, not yet. There's one more before that. It brings protection. Of course, we know that it brings you protection. Psalms 33, verse 20. We wait and hope for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. But this is one of my favorites. It has a tendency to bring praise. To bring praise to the one who created it. Psalms 42, verse 11. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I yet will praise him my Savior, and my God. And then last but not least, number seven, sign number seven is rest. It comes to bring you rest. Psalm 62, verse 5. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. And these are seven things that come when those who know it best, those who take care of it, those who put it in its correct home, those are the seven things that they will find. Those are the seven signs that they carry with them. And something so important that we fail to recognize, that we think of as so little, because we know that the enemy tries to take the littlest things and make them seem as the least important. But you ever wonder why God talks so much about natural disaster? You guys ever notice that? Like, throughout the Bible, God always talks about destruction and tornadoes and earthquakes and whatever you want to call it. But why does he do that? No answers. Okay, because if you think about it this way, even when the earth is taken away, the earth could burn up in flames tomorrow, in flames tomorrow for all you know. But that hope that you have, that you have placed somewhere else, will never be taken away from you. So that hope that you have, those who read the Bible are never afraid of this so-called ending, of this so-called apocalypse. Because no matter what, their hope is in a firm place, in a place that cannot be taken away. Amen? I think I said this before, but there's a difference between the hope that we find in this world and the one that comes from God.
because the one that comes from God works in supernatural ways. But oftentimes what happens is they sort of clash in your life. There's sort of this battle every single day where you kind of have to choose, where does my hope come from? And if you don't believe me, look at Abraham. Look at what Abraham was promised, something that was not natural. See, there was a clash between what was natural, the fact that Sarah could not have children, and what was supernatural, the promise that came from God. So I'm going to go to Romans 4, verse 18. It says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, to shall your offspring, so shall your offspring be. It says, against all hope, Abraham and hope believed. So there were two types of hope that were present in Abraham's life in this moment before he chose to believe God. His natural hope and his supernatural hope. And Abraham chose the hope that came from God. That was the difference. That was the choice that Abraham made. And that's the hope that we have to recognize. Because something so little is probably one of the most important things you will ever deal with in your life as a Christian. That's what sets you apart from everybody else, right? Because your hope will set goals for you, but your faith will carry them out. But one cannot work without the other because we can't pretend to walk by faith when hope is simply your right leg and expectation your left. We'll fall. We'll fail. And I'm going to bring you guys to one more thing. It's in Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 17 through 19. And Cindy, can you do me a favor? Can you look up Hillsong Anchor for My Soul? Thank you. Here it is. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul and secure and enters the inner sanctuary behind our curtain. When we misplace the hope that is given to us by God, that is begun by the Spirit, that's when we lose claim of the promises that were given to us by God. It's like I said, it becomes confusing. Your purpose becomes confusing. You don't know where you're supposed to go. But do you remember what Jesus did before he prayed? When he thanked God, he looked up to heaven because his hope was there. Before and after he was crucified, he looked up to heaven. And that led him along this path, along this journey that was painful, yes. But hope is supposed to be there during pain. It's supposed to be there when it's difficult. It's supposed to be there when we, come, when we become weak. It's part of our strength. But if it's something that we don't carry, or we carry it wrongly, or we misplace it, and that's when we become too tired. That's when we become disinterested. That's when we don't focus anymore. That's when we stop coming at church, because where is our hope placed? And then I can answer you the question, are you a person of faith? Do you have true faith in God? It all starts with that one thing called hope. So if you guys can stand up on your feet really quickly. I didn't want to be long, which I wasn't. But I want you guys to do one thing for me. I want you guys to close your eyes. And I want you to reevaluate. The first thing that you do, the first thing that you do every single morning, the first thing that you do when things become complicated. When was the last time you said to God, my hope is in you. See, because I know you love God, and that's great. But someone once told me, as much as you love God, as much as I can pray to you with faith, if your hope is gone, there's nothing I can do for you. You need to put your trust in me. Yes, I'm here with you, but I'm waiting for you up there. Focus your eyes up there. Lift your eyes to me. And I will restore your sanity to you. 
I will make it clear for you. and your strength, your ever-present help in trouble. God is within her, and because of that, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Continue, you, to say his name. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Our Lord and our Savior. So much power behind that name. And I think throughout this week, there's been some of us that have been distant from him. That haven't said his name. For whatever reason, we kept our mouths shut. When we know deep in our soul, we needed to call out to him. Jesus. Jesus Christ. But the gospel says it's the light, the lamp to our feet. That the apostle Paul said, fixate your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Fixate. Like Natalia was saying, fixate. Invite him, church. Jesus Christ. Invite him. Invite him into your day. Invite him into your heart. Invite him into your mind. Invite him. He's that gentle. He's that loving. He's that kind. See, I love that verse when it says, fixate your eyes. Because we fixate our eyes on so many other things on our boyfriends, our girlfriends, on our work, all the little problems. And we overlook Jesus Christ, the centerpiece of our lives. I know youth, I was once a youth. And we think the world is just so much just piling up on us at, at one instant that we forget how to sort, sort out life. And that's through Jesus Christ. You wanna be successful, you want to stand on a firm foundation. It's through Jesus Christ. No other. Not your job. Not your intelligence. Not your money. It's Jesus Christ. Once you figure out that one little simple formula, that one thing, 
to fixate your eyes on it. That one thing, your life will have meaning like never before. You will have purpose. You will have dreams and desires that will become a reality. But it takes just that one little step from the simple gospel. Fixate. Youth. You are. Do you think you can make this dedication to fixate your eyes on the perfecter, the author of your faith? Can you dedicate yourself to this? Or when you walk out these doors, are you going to be consumed by your everyday problems again and forget the importance of Jesus Christ? Hmm. I can make this promise to all of you. He's never given hope, hope on you. He's never taken his eyes off of you. Because he sees you worthy. Do you see yourself worthy? I think in this last song here, we just need to really take the time. Take this moment. Be greedy with it. Go to the deepest chambers of your heart and allow Jesus to find his place in there. Because some people in here are running on E. They've tried every other venue here on earth to try to solve their problems. But they haven't tried Jesus Christ. Take this moment. Open up your heart. Really open up your heart. And go deep into his presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let your mind play tricks on you. Because even Jesus, being human, became weak. Had moments where he had to cry out to God. He lifted his eyes, not out of routine, but as a reminder that there was a promise, that there was a destiny. And that that destiny would be fulfilled. So as I said, if you can answer the question, are you willing, then I will give you that gift of hope. And from it will come a faith that you've never had before. That I do promise. Amen. For a purpose. My God, 
When I say fix your eyes on me, I mean only me. Put your family in my hands. Put your job in my hands. What I started, I will finish. But don't give up before I've even gotten started. This is only the beginning. There is something greater waiting for you. But disclaimer, this is your warning. If your hope is not on me and not on my supernatural presence, then you will lose it. You will miss out on that opportunity that I have for you this year, waiting for you this year. I need you to look for me for once. I've already found you. I've already brought you here. But this is your turn. This is your step. This is your life that you have to take care of, that you have to take seriously. It does not matter what happens around you. It does not matter the dysfunction that lives around you. My hope will not leave you. I will not leave you, and I make you that promise. Just like I was with my son, I will be with you. And that means we have to cheat even death together. Then even that we will conquer. But you have to choose me, and you have to do it every single day for the rest of your life. Because there will always be a reason for you to give up. My people don't perish because they lost their faith. They perish because they lost their hope. They leave me because they lost their hope. But I've never left. I'm still here. Be willing to cry out for me. And when you get confused, when you become afraid, if you want, you can lift your eyes up to me. Even if that simply means going into my presence, asking my spirit to speak to you. Because there I will find you. And there I will redirect you. And there I will guide you. But it's your decision. You have to move. And then I'll move with you. Don't ask me to direct your steps if you're just standing still all the time. I need you need to learn to worship. The song is not your worship. I am your worship every day. Every day. When you wake up, you worship me. Even when you sleep, your spirit and your soul will worship you. Don't become tired of worshiping me. Because becoming tired, that's just another weapon used against you. That's just another force that works against you. Even Jesus was tired. Of course you're tired. This walk that you walk is not easy. But remember that your desert leads to a promise land. But don't get stuck in your desert. Don't get stuck in your desert. You're still in your desert, but keep moving. Don't stop. My presence will follow you. But you've got to want it more than anything else. More than anyone else. Speak to me, you. I'm still listening to speak. Why are you so quiet all the time? Why are you still so quiet? Is this the way that you would present yourself to me? If you saw me standing right here, wouldn't you cry out for my name? Wouldn't you stand in awe of me? You say that you love me, we'll show it. I've already heard you say it, and I'll show it. Cry out to me. It's not for me, but it's for you. Because you need it. You need the reminder. Because you forget way too easily. You forget what I did. You forget where you are. You forget where you're going. You forget your hope. 
You forget where to place it. Do not ever forget me. Not even for a second. Let me be the first person you think of. No matter what happens, in joy and in pain, I give both and I take both. But in both, your hope shall be on me. And then you will see the supernatural. And then you will see my promises. But not until then. <laughs>